Okay, I'd like to welcome everyone to the seminar. My name is Professor Claire Heffernan. I'm the director of LIDC and I'll be chairing the session today. And apologies, I'm having a, an issue with my, with my camera. Now, you know, clearly the Russian invasion of Ukraine comes on top of years of other crises from COVID-19, climate change, biodiversity not lost, this rising global hunger. And obviously there's really an immediate and deteriorating humanitarian emergency in Ukraine. But our speakers today are going to talk about the domino effect, the implications of this conflict on global food security and ultimately on communities in lower middle income countries. Now, in, in the media, Ukraine is often referred to as a breadbasket, and, and that's within good reason. Uh, you know, Ukraine accounts for about 10% of the global market in wheat. 40% of these exports go to the Middle East and Africa. Uh, Ukraine is a net dairy exporter, again, to the Middle East and Asia. So Ukraine has been a rising commodity a producer in com global commodity markets since independence in the Black Sea region alone, I think, exports at least 12% of global food calories, so including sunflower oil, maize, in addition to wheat. So FAO recently estimated that at least uh, that, that this crisis could push from anywhere from 10 to 12 million people in Africa and Asia into hunger. And of course, you know, that's just the tip of the iceberg. There's a much wider proportion of households that will be pushed into poverty. We know the La Nina effect and, and the Horn of Africa and the related drought is already uh, having an impact on up to 20 million people that are going to be pushed into an, an ongoing humanitarian crisis. So it's clear that we're at this global food security precipice and the Ukraine tragedy just might be the spark that tips us into this wider cascade of events of a global food crisis. So we're delighted to welcome two speakers from the International Food Policy Research Institute to take us through these issues in depth. And now our first speaker, uh, Dr. Joe Glauber is a senior research fellow at IFPRI, where his areas of interest are price volatility, global grain reserves, crop insurance, and trade. Prior to joining IFPRI, uh, Joe spent over 30 years at USDA, where he was chief economist from 2008 to 2014. Now, as chief economist, he was responsible for the department's agricultural forecasts and projections. He oversaw climate change, energy, and regulatory issues. And of, he was chairman of the board of directors of Federal Crop Insurance Corporation. So we are absolutely delighted that he's with us today. So welcome, Joe, and the floor is yours. Well, thanks very much, Claire. And it's, it's really good to be here. It's, uh, uh, I think we were talking earlier that the uh, I feel like this has been almost nonstop since the 24th. And uh, David, my, my, my co-author, and will be presenting in a bit uh, as well, he and I had, had been watching the situation. It started to do a lot of work on, on, on Ukraine and, and, and Russia and what the impact of a war would be. Then about the time we were going to put out our first blog, we had uh, um, the invasion happened. And so after a uh, frantic rewriting, um, I, it seems like it hasn't stopped since. Next slide. Next slide. So I, I think it's important to remember that even prior to the invasion of, of Ukraine uh, by Russia, that prices were at, at nominal highs. We had really seen some uh, big run up in prices from about, um, Midway through 2021, uh, prices really started taking off. This was after recovery after COVID. And the, the, the price increases have been across the board. So cereal prices have been up, primarily wheat. Uh, rice actually is, has been, uh, rice prices have, have continued to be pretty moderate through this. Uh, but wheat prices, uh, maize prices, uh, dairy prices, whole host of, of, of agricultural prices were rising even prior to the invasion. Next slide. And since then, of course, they, they've, uh, since the 24th, that we saw this big increase in prices. We prices, if you were looking at the, the futures markets uh, in those first couple of weeks after um, uh, the invasion, wheat prices were up as high as 70% in the nearby contracts. They've settled down a lot. Uh, I think, although there's still a lot of volatility depending on what news hits the market each day, but uh, prices have continued to be in the 20, 25, 30% range above pre-February uh, 24 levels. 
Next slide. And again, the, the, I, I mentioned that prices had been high before. That's due to a whole range of, of uh, issues. We had um, drought in North America last year that affected the wheat crop in Canada and in the Northern Plains of the US. We had uh, a large drought in uh, China, or excuse me, in Brazil uh, this, this past fall that affected soybean, uh, or has affected soybean production that just has been harvested and is making, starting to make its way into the market. And, and then on top of that, very strong demand. China uh, had record imports over the last couple of years, um, broad-based imports, uh, both meat products, but also uh, um, feed grain imports and wheat and, and uh, soybeans. And so inventory levels, if you look at, at uh, the broad-based measures of what stocks are projected at the end of the year, we're coming into this year at one of the lowest levels that we've seen for the last 10 or 15 years uh, for corn and, and uh, for maize and soybeans, probably the lowest level since 2011-13 period. Um, and for wheat, the lowest since 2007-8 at a time when there were uh, uh, price spikes um, and the so-called food price crisis. We've also, also seen a rising energy costs, rising fertilizer costs, Again, all of this prior to the invasion. Next slide. So again, what was mentioned at the outset, uh, Ukraine and Russia are uh, the major wheat uh, bread basket of the world. These countries were net wheat importers. I mean, that, that's, that is something to really to think about. 30 years ago, during the breakup of the former Soviet Union, they, up until about 2000, they were still on that importing grain and uh, with investments uh, and increased productivity in the region, they have become and regained their role as, as a primary breadbasket of the world. And now it's count in total of about 30% of the wheat that's exported in the world. Again, that varies from year to year. And the, in Russia in particular tends to be, have highly variable production because of the um, a dry, some of the dry regions of which wheat is farmed. But, Again, very major ex, uh, exporter uh, of wheat, big exporter of maize, big exporter of, of vegetable oils or sunflower oil, where between the two of those countries, they account for about 75% of the uh, sunflower oil that is traded on global markets. So again, very important. And uh, as we'll see in a moment, uh, particularly of importance uh, regionally. Next slide. So this is kind of, if you look at, at the share of Russia and, and Ukraine in terms of imported calories, and here we just, uh, we do a, a conversion of all agricultural goods. So, you know, you could look at ag agricultural goods, you can't, you can't add up volumes because of course that, that quite literally is apples and oranges. But if, uh, you know, the more, more common way you often see trade is of course, in dollars or some currency. What we do is we convert every food uh, product into its calories and then add them up that way. And I think that's more indicative, certainly here, of, of where, how important Ukraine is for a number of countries. You can see those dark blues were over 50% uh, of, of uh, uh, imports in terms of calories are coming from that region. Next slide. And in, uh, Indeed, for certain uh, uh, countries, it's very, very important. And we're going to talk about this in, in, in a bit in a little more detail. But Egypt, for example, again, over the last uh, um, 10 years or so, or 20 years, have really gone from almost no imports coming from uh, the Black Sea region. Now, um, you know, the majority of imports uh, for wheat now coming out of that region. Next slide. Okay, so uh, next slide. So now talking a little about Ukraine, there's there's two major, uh, or, well, three three major things that we that that the tragedy that's unfolding right now in Ukraine is is having on on grains and and uh, the, the grain grain and oil seed markets. One is the fact that uh, the crops that were harvested in 2021. Uh, they haven't all ex been exported yet. So about 70% of the, the wheat is typically exported by, uh, you know, uh, late February. Um, so you still have several million 
tons of wheat sitting in, in silos in port and at port facilities waiting to be exported. Uh, with corn, it's even more, it's more like 50% and sunflower seeds and other things even, even um, larger. And so the, the real problem right now is getting old crop out and on top of that, of course, we have a, a, a wheat crop that's planted in the fall in Ukraine and harvested in June, July. So the question is, will they be able to, to harvest that crop? Will they be able to get the inputs they need? Typically, this is the time of year where wheat would be, um, farmers would be putting fertilizers on, on crops. And, um, uh, and then, and then lastly, uh, of course, the planning for spring planning. And, uh, for, for crops like maize and barley and, and sunflowers. Those would all be going into the fields this month, next month, and there you're gonna need inputs like, like fuel. A lot of the diesel fuel obviously is going towards military use. You have uh, uh, inputs like fertilizer. Most of that import uh, fertilizer comes from places like Soviet or from Russia and uh, uh, Belarus. And, um, and then just the manpower, let alone the fact that so much of this is in occupied territory. Um, and so um, as the conflict moves east, you can see that, that a lot of the production is in that region as well. So this is, these are really a big, a big concern. Next slide, David. So, one of the big questions is asked is, okay, is all of a sudden you're cutting off a major supplier of, of you know, 10% of the, the wheat of, of exports are, are now cut off. Where, where are you gonna find the wheat uh, to, to make up for that? I think it's important to remember that about 60% of the wheat in the world um, uh, that ends up in trade is, is wheat that comes from countries that plant in the fall and harvest in, in, in the summer. So that includes the, uh, a large portion of the US, uh, Europe, Ukraine and Russia, we both talked about, we've, we've talked about. And again, these are 60% has, is in the ground right now. So there's no way farmers can really respond to high wheat prices until we start seeing plantings again in the fall. And, and now the big question is, what's the size of the crop? How are you know, bringing uh, those crops to uh, 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 the, the crops that are now emerging from dormancy, um, bring those to, to be able to get a good harvest from. We have another 20% of the crop that will be planted this spring. Some of that in the US, some of that in Canada, um, some of it in, in parts of the of Russia, the far Eastern parts near Kazakhstan and Kazakhstan being the other big, big area of, of spring wheat. This, these tend to be areas that are pretty highly variable in yield. I might add the US uh, ran a survey at the beginning of, of every March, they run a survey asking farmers what they intend to plant. So this is after the war had started and we had already seen these really high prices spike for wheat. When asked how much more uh, wheat would farmers plant in the U.S., the response was no more. I mean, they're gonna, they are gonna plant wheat, but no more than they planted last year. And that's largely because of, of strong prices for maize and, and soybeans and the fact that fertilizer prices are also very high that we're gonna get into in just a moment. Now, lastly, there's a uh, uh, Southern hemisphere, uh, Argentina and Australia in particular, they contribute about 20% of exports in the world. And they too will be planting soon. They just harvested uh, their crops. Both had very good harvest this year. And so hopefully we'll be able to make up some of the, the, uh, the debt with, with, with those countries uh, expanding production perhaps uh, this spring. But again, it's just gonna take a long while until in particular, I think until this fall planted wheat gets uh, um, put in the, or this wheat gets put in the, uh, planted in the fall upcoming fall. Next slide. I mentioned the uh, winter wheat, uh, this fall planted wheat. Uh, you can see sort of the conditions report here. This is on uh, the uh, something called GeoGlam, which uh, is a consortium of earth observation uh, scientists who put together crop conditions and, and monitor crops for uh, along the lines, look at vegetative indices and other things. And so it's early and it's in the Northern hemisphere, obviously uh, you, you don't see much activity uh, except for the fact that the winter wheat crop is, is starting to emerge now. We have a very dry situation in, um, in the US. 
Uh, 36% or so of our of the crop is rated poor or very poor right now. It's it's still very early. I mean, wheat is a grass. If you get a little uh, uh, some rain over the next couple of months, you can help improve that the quality of the the wheat a lot. But right now, if that those areas are very dry. The forecasts are calling for continued dryness in those areas, and um, at least the, the, if you look at the historical record, if you look at the, the, the crop condition where it currently is, it in the past at least has tended to be highly correlated with um, uh, below trend yields. So we'll have to see that. There's also dryness um, in parts of, 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 of Europe. There's some, uh, there's some concerns about the China crop largely because it was planted late um, but again, it looks like both the, those areas have had uh, favorable rainfall, uh, at least uh, uh, to date. The, the big concern, obviously, is, is Ukraine and the fact that, that you know, it's very unlikely that we're going to get much uh, in way of, of um, uh, uh, harvest out of, out of it, or at least it won't make it to the market for, um, you know, it, it's, it's just very uncertain because of the because of the war. But again, dryness in places like the EU, dryness is in the US and all this will be watched very, very closely. And I expect we'll see very volatile markets over the next uh, few weeks as the markets are responding to weather forecasts and other sorts of things. Next slide. So uh, the other thing, important thing to remember is that not wheats are very different. We tend to talk about it like it's one commodity and yet, uh, uh, you know, wheat is used as a feed. It's used as as uh, the wheat that use that's used as a food. Or you know, there's very different types of wheat. You have hard, the harder wheats like and and wheat uh, wheats like durum that are used primarily for semolina and, and uh, pasta production. You have high quality uh, high protein wheats that are used for bread. Uh, production. You have softer wheats that are used for cakes and 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 breads as well, and so people, uh, you know, I think tend to forget. So when we talk about well, where can these supplies come from? It also matters a lot in terms of the type of wheat. And so you know, pasta pasta producers are looking for high quality Durham wheats uh, from around the world, uh, like the northern northern plains of the U.S. or uh, uh, Italy or other places. And so all this is, is a concern, but, but it is also a very important uh, 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 use for feed. So uh, uh, the European Union, for, the, for example, on, um, on average, consume about 40% of the wheat in terms of animal feed. So when you talk about um, the loss of Ukraine corn market to, to the EU or the potential loss, they, those, those uh, animal producers are looking for additional sources of, of feed. There's, there's been some talk that, that uh, well, at least the EU is a lot, looks like they're gonna allow imports of, of corn from the Southern hemisphere, so Argentina and Brazil, but also I think the, the wheat is gonna be uh, seen as an attractive feed. So all this puts pressure on, on wheat prices. Next slide. And because of that, I think that this is the other impact with, with feed prices going up, uh, uh, prices of protein going up for soy, soybean prices going up, that this squeezes uh, uh, profitability margins for animal producers. And so those are, get, are gonna get passed on ultimately to uh, uh, consumers in the form of higher meat, meat and dairy uh, prices. And this is, this is not because they farmers have the ability to pass these costs on. What it means is that some farmers will decide just not to produce as much. And because of that, those supplies will go down and that's what will bring those prices up. Next slide. Okay, David, I'm gonna turn it over to you here. Thank you. Um, thanks and good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm going now to move to the energy and fertilizer markets. Um, because they are also a part of the story and they have already impacted uh, prices uh, today, but they will continue to uh, impact prices uh, in the future. Um, 
So first, I've graphed just to, to show this uh, significant increase since uh, the beginning of 2020. Uh, and as you can see, energy prices and fertilizer prices are moving together. I will uh, say a few words why they can move together. Uh, but you see this very sharp increase. And similarly, then for the food prices, we are reaching level uh, in some cases that were equivalent to what we have seen in 2007, 2008. Uh, so very a significant increase. And now, um, for several reasons, this trend um, is also accelerating with the prices. So one of the uh, reasons when the two are, are, are linked very directly is, for example, one of the key fertilizer that is based on a nitrogenous product. Um, so fertilizer that you will see like ammonia, urea, and, and, and the like are um, many processed through natural gas. And even before the crisis, in particular in Europe, you have seen this significant, uh, since early 2021, increase. And because you can uh, not perfectly integrate the natural gas market, and the only way to basically connect the US market with the European market is full liquefied uh, gas, you, uh, you have this disconnection. Uh, and as of today, people try to bridge the gap and trying to bring more uh, liquefied natural gas to, to Europe. Um, but de facto, the price of natural gas in Europe has been five times uh, higher than in the US, and meaning that the fertilizer price have been higher. But exactly as Doha said for the livestock and the feed market, you also just have a number of producers that stop to produce when the input price is too, 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 too high. So, um, um, uh, uh, in the UK, for instance, at the end of last year, uh, several fertilizer plants have stopped to, to operate. Uh, indeed, the government tried to uh, intervene and basically subsidize them, not only to produce fertilizer, but also to produce uh, carbon dioxide that is used for a number of uh, companies uh, in the food system, by the way, so a lot of intricacies here. Um, but uh, even last, last month, when we had this discussion of lack of fertilizer and very high fertilizer price, one of the big fertilizer companies that is Yara has announced that they will stop operation in uh, France and Italy just to the fact that natural gas was too high and so they cannot remain competitive uh, in this part of, of the world on that. So clearly uh, a link and um, also an impact that can be differentiated across region. Now, if you go to the other type of fertilizer, um, actually on this slide, in the lower uh, part of the slide, you see how much of each type of fertilizer, at least for this product, is traded globally. So you see that for urea, for instance, there is just 30% of urea that is uh, traded globally. And there's a lot of domestic production, mainly because you can make it from natural gas, uh, basically everywhere, or also from coal. Uh, but uh, for the other type of fertilizer, in particular, the one linked to phosphate or uh, potash, because there is a much stronger mining uh, aspect of them and that the uh, resources are unevenly distributed on Earth, you have a much higher concentration. And what you can see on, uh, on this line now, if you just take the case of potash, is that Belarus and Russia represent when they are both combined, 41% of the global market of potash. And of course, that's uh, based on how they have been um, at the center of, of, of the invasion of Ukraine. But also Belarus had already uh, some clear issues in terms of political violence and, and the hijack of the uh, Ryanair plan last year, some uh, sanction applied to it. It created really this um, uh, this shortage on the market. Um, and uh, that's not easy to replace them, that's even less, more difficult to replace uh, Russia on the, uh, the potash market than to replace Russia on the wheat market, for instance, uh, because you cannot just ask uh, people to change their decision from one year to another. It takes uh, years to have a new mining operation in business. 
at the same time, people are not just going to open a mining operation for a, a couple of years. And uh, you see this uh, significant uh, bottleneck here. And just to give you uh, here two maps, that shows also the fact that here clearly it's a global problem. If you remember the, the map that Joe have shown in the um, earlier, where but which country import calories from Russia and Ukraine, uh, you had some colored part in Northern Africa, in Middle East, up to West Africa, and a few dot here and there. When we talk about the fertilizer, everyone is concerned, in particular, um, not only the bread basket of the world, but the food basket of the world, that is Brazil, Argentina, uh, and, and the like. But also some countries in Africa that are dependent for 90 or 80% of their fertilizer supply or some type of fertilizer uh, from, uh, from Russia and Belarus in particular. And even if you can think that, oh, in Africa, they are not using uh, so much fertilizer, so it's not a problem. I would say on the contrary, meaning that marginally, one ton of fertilizer in, uh, in Africa can uh, be much more important for the local producer than uh, one ton of fertilizer in country like Europe or the US that are using a uh, high level already and actually they can cut a bit their fertilizer use without uh, uh, a proportional reduction, for example, in their yield. So now uh, I'm going to move more to something that is more uh, um, important in terms of consequences and that can really also inform uh, the type of uh, policy uh, response we want to uh, to see and to understand also the different channels. So I'm going to move to this idea that we can look at the vulnerability of countries over different um, indicators, if you want, different channels about how um, the, the crises are impacting them um, up to the point that we can have a kind of big picture of what's going on right now and potentially in the coming month. So, Joe has started uh, his section by saying, you see, on world market prices have uh, increased uh, significantly uh, for the last uh, year or so. And when there is imperfect transmission between world markets and domestic markets, we see also a, a, similar, um, a, a similar trend. Of course, there is a lot of local condition that matters. So very high inflation in, in Venezuela, but we should not blame the world market for that, or we should not blame even the, the, the Ukraine crisis for, for that. Similarly, in Sri Lanka, and you have seen in the news that the country is really uh, shaken by, by riots and things like this, there was a lot of condition before the crisis and local uh, even policy choices that have led to that. But overall, very strong uh, food inflation, meaning that people are very sensitive to that. And in particular for poor household, uh, in many places, their income have not follow this uh, food price increase, in particular for urban households um, that have been already been not only infected in terms of prices, but also infected in terms of income and income opportunity due to the COVID-19 crisis itself uh, with lockdown in urban center that have disrupted their uh, economic activity. Now, so far we have talked a lot about, you know, wheat in particular and how much some countries import uh, import wheat from uh, the uh, black sea area and if i take a very uh, striking example for example it's yemen where yemen you know initially you not have any a problem of food price inflation but actually a conflict uh, famine condition or near famine condition in several parts of the countries and you have a country that is relying a lot on uh, wheat uh, in terms of caloric supply for its population, basically 46% of the daily intake of uh, calories in Yemen is based on wheat uh, product, and of which Ukraine and Russia represent basically half of the supply. There's nearly no domestic supply of wheat in Yemen. Um, and why they receive and they import some uh, wheat from Australia and from the US, uh, Ukraine and Russia are key players there. And so 
you see a very direct impact about a description on wheat and on wheat from the Black Sea on a country that was already very fragile. Now this picture is going to change significantly when we move uh, around the world. Um, and I'm going to illustrate it, meaning that if you move to uh, some countries in West Africa, for instance, yes, most of the wheat they consume can come from either Europe, Western Europe or uh, Ukraine, or in particular Russia, but wheat is not a major item in uh, the diets, uh, in particular when you move to rural areas. So the consequence, direct consequence in terms of food security, for instance, is not so much for the wheat market, but will be much more, you know, on this, for example, fertilizer story, when a lot of local production is going to be uh, impacted by a shortage of fertilizer. We can come back during the Q&A on this fertilizer story, but really, uh, currently in Africa, it's not just a problem of prices, it's really a problem of availability, meaning that uh, some other markets right now are um, supplied in priorities, and you just have no shipment of fertilizer that are going to several uh, African countries currently. So, as I've said, now, if you look at the, the big pictures and the caloric dependency coming from uh, Ukraine, Belarus, and Russia, um, so in terms of calorie, Belarus doesn't really matter, but because it's part of the conflict and the sanction I have included here, when you see it as a share of not just the imports, but also the overall domestic supply in terms of, of uh, and actually domestic consumption in terms of food. And on this map, then you, of course, we have the same situation with Egypt and, and with Yemen. Uh, you start to also clearly see uh, Sudan um, and uh, country like Mauritania. You have some country also in Central uh, Africa that are exposed. Um, and a region that we may forget sometimes but also it, the rest of, of the, the Caucasus and uh, Central Asia. Uh, and here, the fact that Russia um, economy is currently uh, obviously hurt by the sanction, but also that Russia is implementing export restriction and I will come back to, to that specific channel. You have other part of the, of the, of the world that is going to be uh, in a very uh, dire situation and even if they do not face major hunger problem. Actually, they face a number of nutrition problem that will make will be worse uh, with uh, with this uh, current crisis. And yes, export restriction is typically the type of policy response that we try to or we don't want to see, but that are actually on the rise. Meaning that because food prices go up on world markets. Uh, and potentially more food want to be exported by uh, to world markets because you know that's what farmers and company want to do they are selling uh, where they can make more money um, government say no 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 we are going to try to keep the food uh, within our borders um, and so they import export, export ban export uh, quota through uh, licensing and, and the like and you see on the left hand side um, I will not enter in detail, but you know, if you have basically a, a colored country, it means that they are putting a significant restriction on their own product and the uh, dots um, are also showing the magnitude of this um, a restriction for the product they export. And clearly uh, the country in conflict have implemented the, these measures. Uh, and we have seen a domino effect through all the, the MENA countries. Uh, and finally, uh, when you start to see globally what it means, that we, we have this red line on the right hand part of my slide that is showing that we are already reaching level of restriction that we were uh, facing in 2007, 2008, uh, especially during the first part of 2008, when during the COVID-19 crisis at the beginning of 2020, we have seen this movement, but very quickly countries have, um, have discussed uh, both through a better monitoring and peer review process and also to understand that uh, that was not the way to go, the situation was under control. And really the question now is to see if we're going to continue to see uh, a, a domino effect that will spread around the world. So now when you connect the fact that different countries uh, are facing different initial condition, some are very food insecure to start with, some are less food insecure to start with. The fact that 
some are directly linked to these markets, some are less linked to this market. Some also have actually significant food reserve at home, for example, Egypt, they have more than more or less six months of reserve because they are right now four months of reserve, but they are going to harvest their own wheat um, uh, in the, the coming, uh, coming week. So even if they have a big wheat importer and a big wheat importer from the Black Sea, and they want to find other suppliers, there is not an immediate threat when Lebanon has between 30 and 40 days of stock. And therefore, the question is uh, very a bit more urgent for them. Um, then you have countries that uh, also are not really buying on the Black Sea, but just buying on food markets, a world market and face higher prices. Include and some countries that actually also are victim of a domino effect coming from the export restriction, meaning that, oh, normally I buy my stuff from Argentina, and now Argentina is paying an export restriction um, in reaction to the, the rising food, uh, the, 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 the world prices and the disruption coming from Ukraine, and I am more in trouble. And then you have also countries like, uh, like Morocco that on top of that have to face a local drought um, and in the introduction that has also been raised, you know, we have uh, different local conditions. So meaning that we have actually a uh, very various level of, uh, of uh, intensity of, of problems. And here is just an example of, of vulnerability. Um, there is different criteria that can be used, but just to give an idea of finally how we can prioritize action and, and think about it um, in a more inclusive way. At the same time, some countries are vulnerable, but can manage pretty well on their own. I mean, like, yes, South Korea is a big net food importer. They are going to be significantly uh, and directly impacted by higher world food prices, but they don't have, you know, a, a nutrition attire situation from to, to start with. Um, but they are going to pay a much higher cost on, on world food market for, for feeding their population. So, now we, we talk about uh, some of these, and, and uh, don't worry, we are going to, to stop soon for, for the Q&A. Uh, but, you know, uh, I want to say a few words about the, the kind of diet quality and, and cost of uh, affording a, even healthy diet, because obviously we have talked about wheat, uh, price of this, of the bread go up. Uh, but just after the price of bread, we have also seen that vegetable oil have been basically the, actually the main drivers or the most extreme group of commodities in terms of price increase. And when you think about food diversity, you start with staple, then you get vegetable oil, then you get a bit uh, fruit and vegetable, then animal product. But really, we, we have this issue. And when the basic calories become more expensive, people try to cut on the more um, uh, luxury goods. And when you are poor, uh, having a, a bit of uh, milk or a bit of uh, chicken is already a luxury good and that will be sacrificed. And so in terms of food diversity, you have this uh, direct effect. And just the increase of cost actually of dairy and of, um, of, of uh, animal product and poultry meat consent um, can be very significant in terms of uh, budget expenditure, especially for not the extremely poor, but the, the, the poor people, because we are starting about food that are not cheap, uh, calories that are not, not, not cheap. And so when you see, uh, as shown by one of the uh, figures by, by Joe, a 60% increase in terms of the, the, the price of, of, of meat uh, represent many more uh, dollars than a price increase of 60% on uh, cost of wheat, for instance, uh, especially for some intermediate household. Last but not least, on the right-hand side of, of, of my slide, I want to say that even when we think about, oh, we don't have sunflower oil from Ukraine, so we have to move to something else. The alternative doesn't have the same nutritional uh, features, for instance. So uh, sunflower oil have a lot of vitamin E. Moving to soybean oil, we'll get less vitamin B. And moving to palm oil, actually, you have even less vitamin B, and you are moving from um, unsaturated fat to saturated fat. So also, we, we have these other uh, elements taking place. And maybe the last point I want to make when we think about um, uh, nutrition and uh, just really the food security of, of countries that are um, really uh, exposed to, to shock, uh, a lot of uh, actually the food and um, 
even the, the food, um, the, f the, 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 the fortified food and the nutrient supplements uh, for a country like Yemen are provided by the WFP. And some of these products cannot come directly from Ukraine or Russia, but are processed by intermediary countries. So for instance, you see on this, uh, on this graph that there's a lot of fortified wheat flour or fortified sunflower oil. And this fortification states can take place in Turkey with a raw product that come from the other side of the Black Sea. And why I raise this is because when you implement sanctions and restriction, uh, you have a number of intermediaries in small and medium sized enterprises in, um, in third parties that are impacted by the sanction or by the fear of sanction or their, their bank refuse to do operation. And you have a full value chain uh, in the food sector that are going to be disrupted, even if from day one, the sanctions say, oh, WFP can still procure uh, wheat to Russia. Actually, it's not as simple as that when you start to, to do that. So a uh, concluding slide on, on policy response in particular for the short term. So yes, the trade sanctions should avoid food and fertilizer products, but also really understand how markets and companies operate, uh, because yes, sometimes there is an oversimplification, or for some sanctions that are very clear when they are implemented by the US Treasury or the European uh, Union, uh, how they are understood and the practice in countries where um, legal framework cannot be um, as easy to manipulate or at least as to understand than in more advanced economies is pretty important. Then we have this export restriction cascade and the domino effect that we see today that has to, to stop uh, clearly. And uh, while we understand that countries want to protect their own constituency, there is different way to do it and smarter way than just putting uh, an export ban. Because actually keeping food within your country doesn't mean that it's going to reach the most vulnerable household within your countries. Uh, we want to promote coordination and avoid hoarding behavior or, or panic buying, uh, especially among importers. Right now, uh, also, because the price of oil is going up, you have some countries that are net food importer, uh, like Iraq, but doesn't lack money, so they can actually buy at more or less any price. Um, but come the question also, can we uh, have a different uh, way to facilitate payment by uh, less uh, favored countries, or can we even pool some resources to help them to pay for that? We still have the issue of biofuel also that use a significant amount of uh, grains, but also vegetable oil. Uh, currently, it's more than 31 million tons, uh, 31,000 million tons of vegetable oil that are used to produce biodiesel. And in a situation where actually vegetable oils are scarce and prices extremely high, um, when you have a policy that forces people to burn biofuel in their cars, when there is no policy that forces people to have access to a food product for their own consumption, there is clearly an imbalance. And then both in terms of social safety net for consumers and producers, uh, we need to make sure that uh, vulnerable people are protected, but also things are well targeted. Um, and for example, on the fertilizer uh, sector, the goal is not to start to uh, buy fertilizer and distribute it evenly over the world. Uh, there is some prioritization to be done, but uh, households that are going to be deprived from fertilizer will have to be compensated in one way or another. Um, so that's the overall situation. Um, as you see, a lot of contents, a lot of effect, but now we are pretty happy to, to uh, have a discussion with, with you and, um, and stopping here. So I'm going to stop to share my screen and thanks again for, for your uh, attention. Okay, thanks very much. I mean, those were two excellent presentations that really gave us a sense of, of the complexity of this issue. So I know that there's a few, we're a little low on time and there's a few audience questions. So let me see if I can go back and find somehow on my phone. Let me see. Alessia, can you read out the first question? Oh, yes. So the first question is, could this invasion on top of the past few years of global disasters such as COVID, floods, fires, can be a catalyst for the re-emergence of locally based food systems with less environmental footprint? 
So which speaker would like to take that one? I can start and then Jojo will, will follow up. So I, I think that obviously having less environmental footprint is important. Now, the, the idea of locally based food system are better. Um, when you are hurt by your drought, your local food system is not resistant at all. So ask people in Morocco today if they want to have a self-sufficiency on a daily basis, they will say no. So the question is much more having have a more resilient system regionally and globally um, and to see how we manage risk um, than to uh, just uh, uh, having everyone is a little um, in a little segment. Now, the key issue right now we face is to make sure that also this long term sustainability and the reduction of environmental footprint is not forgotten in the middle of the crisis. And what we don't want is to see policy that actually undermine some of the effort that have been done uh, in terms of uh, reducing uh, emission or protecting some uh, natural ecosystem or actually pro promoting soil health to not be forgotten because why, you know, uh, we have this Ukraine crisis and we get the COVID crisis, for example, the, and this crisis will go away at one point. The climate crisis is not going to go away. So really there is this articulation about thinking about how we can make the food system more uh, resilient, sustainable, but he also avoiding uh, some uh, simplification of, of, of the story in one way or another. Joe, maybe you, you want to, to follow up? Yeah, and it's just to, to kind of echo a little bit what David said. And, and, and frankly, I think that, you know, for all the problems, I think that supply chain issues that emerged during COVID and now with this crisis, frankly, the system is, is, the, is, is, is remarkably resilient. I mean, it, the, these countries that are sourcing so much of their grain from Black Sea are right now finding other suppliers. The world is not going to run out of wheat, and I think that that's something that is a mess. We're going to run down stocks likely this year, and I think that prices are going to be really high, um, and that points towards how to help the most vulnerable in this sort of situation. But it's not for the fact that they won't be able to get wheat. They will be able to get wheat, but it's going to come at a, at a price, and I think that means targeted consumer subsidies, well-targeted consumer subsidies, because you don't want to just I mean, for those who can afford those sorts of things or can, can switch to other uh, sources of calories, uh, you know, I think that's, you know, that, that will happen. But for those uh, people that are heavily dependent on wheat and, and uh, you know, I think they, they will need humanitarian assistance in some cases and, and certainly targeted subsidies. And again, the poor countries won't be able to afford that nearly as much as say a middle, middle income country like, uh, Egypt, but. Okay, thank you. And now let's see if we've got our next question, please. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, I will ahead. After disasters such as this, uh, how long it is, uh, is it anticipated before a local food system can recover? And when it does, will it be the same or will it have significant changes occurred due to the gap in the market? Well, first, let me let me address Ukraine, which I think is is the, the big issue in, in one sense. I mean, maybe that's not really what the question's about, uh, but but there, I think there's a very real question about how fast that recovers. And and right now, the big uncertainties, obviously, and I, and I think that it's it's easy to sort of tumble to a worst case scenario that we're not going to see much of that wheat. Uh, being moved and other commodities move into the global market this year. Um, uh, hopefully, you know, the wars resolve quickly and, but there's already been a lot of damage to infrastructure, the port facilities. Uh, I was talking to, in the conference yesterday with people in Ukraine talking about how difficult it was that they are moving a little bit of grain out through uh, Romania, out through Gdansk and, and into the Baltic Sea, but it's, that comes at a huge cost, and the, the system, the infrastructure, just can't handle replumbing all of the, the grain and oilseed trade out through the West, as you know, compared to where all the rail lines and everything else now funnel down through the, the uh, to the Black Sea, and so that that will take uh, adjustments, and hopefully, instead, what we'll see is return to to 
a, a more normal situation and the ports regain and that Russia and Ukraine will continue to be big providers for the rest of the world. Maybe okay. just to quickly follow up, uh, when we go beyond just Ukraine, I, I think that, you know, the capacity of countries to protect uh, the poor also, but also a lot of small and medium enterprises that are really the, I would say the core uh, ecosystem or, or food system is very important. So, you know, if you go through the crisis and you manage to protect um, all the, the small companies producing food, if you are in the developing countries also, uh, some of you know the street vendors and, and in some cases also there's a big gender dimension and when the situation go back to normal all of these people are still in business or can operate then it's like the crisis uh, has not really happened uh, except for some people that have maybe deprived of some key nutrient during this crisis now if you really have created long-term damage in this economic tissue then uh, you, you may much more time to uh, to recover um and uh there's also a question that can follow up on that so i stop here okay great thank you um can i just pipe in with chair's prerogative here for a question you know in 2008 it wasn't that we didn't have enough grain it was the countries were hoarding grain now do you see another scenario like that happening or do you think that this is going to be a more the, of a blip and that we're going to be able to accommodate these supply chain issues with Ukraine? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question and, and a huge unknown at this point. Uh, 2000, you're absolutely right. 2007, eight, uh, you know, we saw very, very high prices for, for a lot of commodities, but wheat and rice really uh, were the ones that, that got a lot of the attention, um, particularly wheat early on. And, and wheat was entirely due to the fact we had two back-to-back droughts in, in Australia. So there were a lot of supply issues involved with, with the wheat um, uh, uh, price hikes that we saw in, in late 2007, 2008. And particularly, as I mentioned earlier, the types of wheat. So the really hard wheats that uh, there, there was just a real shortage at, at one point. And in the US, for example, wheat was going over, uh, the futures markets were over $20 a ton or uh, $20 a bushel. And you haven't seen those prices nearly that high yet here uh, during this crisis, thankfully. Um, it, but but also it was all of those export restrictions. So uh, countries like India put on export restrictions on wheat. Russia had export restrictions. Um, uh, Argentina, you know, all these big suppliers. And remember that chart I showed where where the potential wheat could come from. If you start shutting those off with export restrictions, you can really make a bad situation very, very much worse. In the chat, I put a, a link to a, a tracker that, that David has developed that uh, has scrapes all the data on what restrictions are being put on exports at the, at the moment. And there's a nice piece in that tracker. You can go back and look at and compare that to 2008 um, uh, in terms of, of uh, uh, you know, how much uh, food is 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 there? What sort of impact there is on on food trade in the world in terms of kilo, what percent of global kilocalories are involved and and other measures? So it's very instructive. But thus far, the good news is is that India this year, instead of putting on a ban, has said that it could actually export maybe seven to ten million tons of wheat, which would help um, make up the difference. Argentina, I think, is is. Uh, it will be interesting to watch because they have had in the past um, export bans uh, or they, they put in restrictions on beef exports at the end of last year. They currently have registrations, which are restrictions of sorts on, on vegetable oil or on soybean oil and soybean meal. And so uh, hopefully they won't put anything on, on wheat, but a loss of Argentine exports would be, a, a, again, another gap to fill up. And remember, we do have restrictions on exports coming out of Russia, and Russia has been uh, probably the most active user of that, those sorts of policies over the last 10 years. David mentioned that they have export bans on, on uh, movement of wheat actually the other way through uh, Kazakhstan and into Central Asia. And that's largely to prevent leakage. They have an export tax on, on wheat and they were concerned that people would try to funnel grain out through the, the, the east. And so 
again, these are all things to, to watch, but they, the lessons of 2007-8 was, you're right, that there were supplies out there, but uh, when you start locking them up by hoarding them for your domestic, uh, uh, to, to sort of calm domestic markets, you export all that volatility onto the uh, rest of the world. And just to follow up on that, I think that, yes, we, we, we may have right now a bit of this risk, uh, and especially also some countries that may panic and start to hold things. So what the last thing we want is panic. Um, but the key story here also is that that's governments and basically public power that are creating a lot of this problem. And sometimes we will see discussion, oh, that's a speculation. You see private companies. No, no, the people holding and creating an artificial shortage on the markets where government and how governments today. Um, and so that's really where, you know, uh, policy dialogue and, and making sure that the right policy is put in place is so important, not to try to uh, enter uh, the, the wrong problem. Now, we still have a giant order in the world right now that China. China has potentially very large inventories. Of course, there's uncertainty about the exact amount but the kind of official number that circulate is they have more than one year of stock for wheat, for instance, and they still continue to buy on world markets. Uh, so is it just for uh, domestic security reason? Is it linked to the, the past and the current COVID fears they have? Or is it also because the quality of their stocks is, um, is problematic? And here I would just say that also one of the policy response that you can hear around is, oh, we need to buy more reserve, bigger stock. But managing stock is difficult. Uh, you have significant losses in quantity and quality. And in order to have food systems that are more efficient, not only also more resilient, but we make sure that we don't want to lose food. We don't want to waste the water and the nutrients that have been used to grow grains. We don't want this grain to rot in silos during months or, or years and after people having to buy again and buy again. So just also keep, important to keep this in mind. But yes, there is a pile of grain in the world today that seems to be in China. Um, is it going to be available? And what is the quality of this pile of grain? There is big question mark here. All right, thank you. And you know what? I want to thank our two brilliant speakers for just bringing us into this issue in a very detailed, and but yet still very compelling and easy to understand way. I'm afraid we're really out of time. It's uh, 13.59. So I want to thank both our speakers and I want to thank our audience today. Uh, you've been absolutely brilliant. And um, please, we'll be absolutely happy to share any further questions on social media or to continue this debate. So thanks very much, everybody. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.